Welcome to Faith Point, the podcast ministry of First Southern Baptist Church of Prescott Valley with Senior Pastor Carol Eldreth. Our goal is to allow our faith to intersect with real life. So let's join Pastor Carol today as he shares with us from God's Word. So, uh, that being said, let's bow in prayer as we come to God's Word. Heavenly Father, thank you for, for your grace and your goodness. Thank you for your Word. And we, Father, we thank you for, for your, your watch and care over us. We do take a moment, Father, to pray for our veterans today. We pray that, that you would bless these men and women who serve. They're here in this room. Uh, we thank you for the sacrifices that they made, for the time they gave away from their families, for the dangers uh, and, and issues that, that go along with that, that they've dealt with, and maybe continue to deal with that even today. And Father, we thank you that your hand of protection is on them, and your love has always been with them. We pray for those who are serving today. Pray for those who are, who are, who are in harm's way right now, those who are in danger, uh, those who are training. Father, we pray that you would touch their lives, that you would, that you would guard them. Pray for our, our president and and as he, as he gives them orders, we pray, Father, for, for their commanders. We pray that your wisdom would prevail in all that they do. And, Father, we pray now that you would just continue to shine your blessing upon them. Father, we pray now that you'd meet us around your word. As we think about what it means to, to live in this world as believers, how we, how we learn to think the way that you think. And, and, Father, let us have your mind now. For we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, I want you to take your Bibles and find the book of Romans. We are still in Romans, a testament of faith and action. We're starting in Romans chapter 12 today. And, um, and that means we still have several chapters to go. So we're not going to get through with Romans this year. We'll still be in Romans as we come into next year a little bit. Um, but, but that's okay. Um, to, today we're looking at Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. What do you think? Romans 12, 1 says this, Therefore I urge you, brothers, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God. This is your spiritual act of worship. So I want you to look at your sermon notes there, because I don't think that's going to come up on the screen. I don't think I put it up there. But I want you to read this with me um, out of the New International Version. Uh, read it out loud with me. Again, Romans 12:1. Therefore, I urge you, brothers, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God, which is your spiritual act of worship. Now, I don't have to say anything else because we all do that all the time already, right? Well, maybe, maybe not all the time. Maybe we struggle with that sometimes. Maybe we struggle with that a lot. Um, and so the, here's the question that, that many of us wrestle with. Can a person really change? And by that, I mean, can they stop being the way, one way, and start being another? And I'm not talking about just taking on some new philosophy or ideology or, or some, a system of religious beliefs. I'm talking about a genuine, all-encompassing change from the inside out. Can that happen? Can a person change from being insecure to secure? Can a person really change from being lazy to industrious? Can a person change from being dishonest to honest? Can they change from being perpetually angry to being consistently peaceful? Can they change from being pessimistic to optimistic? Can they change from selfishness to being generous? Those are major inside-out changes. Can those things really happen? Can that kind of change happen in a person's life? Can a person really change? And I want to tell you right now that it can indeed happen. Those kinds of changes can happen. And today, I'm going to discuss with you some ways to help create that kind of change that God wants to make in your life. But I also want you to realize from the very get-go here that radical change doesn't happen often. That's why we doubt that those things would happen because we don't see it in our own lives and we don't see it in a lot of other people's lives many times. And so we think, you know, God talks about all this change stuff, but I never see it happen much. And unfortunately, it doesn't happen, but could happen every day. Um, It doesn't happen nearly as often as it should or nearly as often as it could. Most people 
are so trapped in their habits and their behaviors that we begin each day chained to yesterday and we're doomed to repeat the same mistakes over and over and over and over again. It's like, it's like we just have this perpetual uh, Groundhog Day that we just get up and we do the same thing, making the same mistakes day after day. But it does not have to be that way. That's not what God desires for us because change does come, it, but it does not come easily. It takes three things to experience that kind of change, that lasting change that most of us aren't willing to invest in. So let me share with you real quickly three necessities for lasting change to take place. Three things that have to happen for lasting change to happen. The first is a change of, it, it change, that kind of change takes time. It takes time. And we're in, a, we're in a society, and we've grown up with everything being really fast. We're a microwave uh, society. I don't want to wait for something to take a long time. I just want to put it in the microwave, or microwave and zap it for 30 seconds and go. But that's not how change happens. We would rather be changed in an instance. Most of us aren't willing. Um, we want something to uh, be different in some area of our life, but we want it to be you know, right, right now, not later. And so, God, if I'm going to change, if you're going to change me, I want you to do it right now. Um, and, you know, most of us who are struggling to get into our uniforms today <laughs> want to be physically fit. But we don't always want to wait the five to six to seven or eight months it takes to get in shape. We don't want to invest that time. Most of us who are in debt want to get out of debt today, even though it took years and years and years to get in the kind of debt that some are in. Most of us who are impatient want to be patient, but we want it right now. So we have this issue of time that has to take place. Change takes time. Secondly, change, uh, change takes effort. It takes effort on our part. But too often, we would rather for change to be imposed on us. We don't like to change in the first place. So if you've got to change, you know, just make it happen to me. The doctor tells me I have to change, and then my wife agrees with the doctor, and so now I guess I have to change. And so we want somebody to make us have to do that. If we have to do it voluntarily, very seldom do we really care to change that much, that we will put the effort in to have that happen. Um, we don't have to make those tough, the tough choices that are required for change. We'd rather have those things made for us. It takes that effort. It requires making decisions that we don't want to make. It requires saying no when we want to say yes, and saying yes when we really want to say no. And we're not good at that. We're not happy about that. And people don't change because it takes effort. So let me ask you a question real quickly. If there were some kind of a pill, maybe an Apostle Paul pill, or maybe it is a Billy Graham pill, or a Mother Teresa pill, or maybe it is any pill for any person that you really admire in the faith, maybe it's just a general Christian pill. And if you took that one pill, it would, it would give you all those characteristics and all those changes would take place in your body. And you didn't have to have any more effort than just putting a pill in your mouth and swallowing it. Would you take that pill? I think most of us would say, yes, we would do that. Now, the downside of that is that there is no magic pill like that. There is not one and there never will be. And, and the reason we're not as good as we should be or as good as we could be is because change isn't as easy as taking a pill. It takes effort. And then thirdly, lasting change takes not only time and effort, but it also takes a strategy. You have to have a strategy. You have to have some strategy to make it work. I won't ask you to raise your hand, but has somebody ever walked up to you in church or at work or somewhere in the neighborhood and handed you a diet book? If they do that, you may not be happy about it, but one thing you do know is that, boy, maybe I need to be on a diet. Somebody is thinking, I need to be on this diet. And there are about a zillion diet plans out there. I understand that. And maybe you've tried them. Maybe you've, maybe you've gotten a book. 
someone gave it to you or someone recommended it or you just went down to the self-help place at the, at the bookstore when we did have bookstores and you picked one up or whatever, you went to Amazon and got one, uh, whatever it might be, and you said, I am committed to this. I'm going to be committed to this diet and you work at it for maybe a whole month. And you, you struggle and you deny yourself the things you want to eat and you get to the end of the month and you've lost about a pound and a half. And then somebody comes along and they say, hey, I just tried this diet, and in three weeks, I've lost seven pounds. And you're thinking, well, that's not fair. I've been struggling, and I got a pound off, and you've, you're, you're walking away seven pounds lighter than you were three weeks ago, and I've been working at it for four weeks, and I'm just not making any progress here. And we get frustrated by that, and... and and I'm not trying to, to hawk any kind of different, you know, different kinds of things that we have to do, but, but if we have a strategy that's yielding zero results, maybe we need a new strategy. Maybe the one you're on is not working, and so maybe you've got to find one that's going to work. Rather than just doing the same thing over and over again, it's going to take a long time to get in your uniform if you're only losing a pound a month. And so it takes strategy. Change takes time, it takes effort, it takes strategy, and because of this, change doesn't happen easily, and it doesn't happen often. And we think, that's all right, because I don't like change. How many of you think that? You know, unfortunately, it seems the older we get, the less we like change. We don't want to see change. Don't change the order of worship, don't change where I sit in my pew. Don't change the time of the service. I don't like change. Well, let me give you an uncomfortable truth today. Uncomfortable truth today, spiritual truth is this. The Christian life, friends, is all about change. It is. That's, that's the essence of the Christian life. It changes us. It is about change. God intends for us to change. If we didn't need to change, Jesus wouldn't have had to come and die on the cross. We have to have change in our lives to follow Jesus Christ. We have to have change in our lives to become like him. And as much as you may hate change, you cannot be a good believer. You cannot be a Christian and follow Jesus Christ the way you're supposed to if you're not willing to change. But change is not easy because it takes time and it takes effort and it takes strategy. And we're not willing to invest those things very often. But the Christian life is all about transformation. You see, God's plan is not here just to save us from an eternal punishment. Now, it does that, but that's not the sole focus of, of our being believers, of our being followers of Jesus Christ. Because God's plan is to change us, to transform us from the sinful creatures that we, that we are into the image of his son, Jesus Christ, uh, and, and to be formed, to have Jesus Christ formed in us. And he wants us to be like Jesus. And so our, our, our goal is to be able to be like him and to give him ourselves. And that never happens in an instant. It takes time. It isn't imposed on us. It requires effort on our part. And most of all, it takes an effective strategy. And so that's what I'm going to talk about today primarily is the strategy part of it. Um, there's a key component in, in this biblical strategy for change that, that Paul's going to lay out for us here in these two verses. And the key component is this, that if you want to change, you have to start by renewing your mind. If you want to change, you renew your mind. That's what he says. He says you're going to have to renew your mind, and then you're going to have to think new thoughts. You're going to have to learn to think differently. Think thoughts that you don't think right now. Notice what he goes on to say in Romans 12, 2, the next verse. Do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. And so the first challenge that Paul lays out for us is, is not conforming to the pattern of this world. He says, stop thinking like the world thinks. And we do that. 
whether we do it consciously or unconsciously, we're all prone to thinking the way that the world thinks. So maybe we need to ask a question real quickly. How does the world think? How do we recognize it if we're thinking that the, the way that the world thinks? Um, let me give you some examples. Well, for, you know, for starters, how does the world think? The world says that this world is all that there is. That this physical and this material world that we have, this life that we have, this stuff that we get, that's all there is. And then we die and it goes, all goes away and we're done. The world thinks that, that our hope for the future is dependent upon our economic prosperity and our political situation. The world tends to think that, that um, the definition of right and wrong can actually change from age to age and from region or location to, to region. So what might be right here and now might not necessarily be right over there and then. And so depending on where I'm at in the world or where I'm at in the country or where I'm at in my life or whatever time it is, I can, I can figure out what's right and what's wrong and, and then you can't be mad at me because it's right for my situation right now. And the world also says that everything revolves around you. That we look at our world through our eyes and we say it's all about me. Or it's about me and my family. And, and so... Our objective as believers is to learn to identify that worldly kind of thinking and then learn to make the distinction between how the world teaches us to think and how God teaches us to think so that we don't fall in the trap of believing those and so many other things that the world teaches. So how am I going to do that? How do I test for worldly versus godly thinking? How do, I, how, do I, how do I test something to say, is this the way that God thinks or is this the, world, the way that the world thinks? The way that the world thinks um, is different than the way that God thinks and it's not all that hard to figure out. It's, it's literally this simple. If a line of thought leads to hopelessness and despair, it's not from God. If ultimately there's no hope and there's only despair at the end of the rainbow, then that's not God speaking. That's not his thinking. So if it's leading to hopelessness and despair, then it's not from God. However, if a line of thought, a line of thinking, leads us to a greater understanding, an understanding of the love, the mercy, the grace, the forgiveness, the power, the holiness, the majesty of God, then that's from him. That's from God. One leads to hopelessness and despair. One leads to love and understanding of who God is and his grace and his mercy and his, and his salvation in our lives. Now, how do you then, uh, how, do you, how do you go about that? Paul says, be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Change the way you think. Learn to think a different way. Paul says, be transformed by the renewing of your mind. This is how you change and you've probably heard about positive thinking all your life. Most of you are old enough to remember Norman Vincent Peale. Um, and uh, he used to say, change your thoughts and you can change your world. And you know, actually that's true. Change your thoughts and you change your world. It's true, but it's not as easy as it sounds. Even though it's true, it doesn't make it easy. And so um, it's, it's a little more difficult than just saying, okay, I've just changed my thoughts, so now everything is going to change. But, but be, let me tell you uh, something about changing your thoughts. It's not easy because it takes what? It takes time, and it takes effort, and it takes strategy. And you can't get around those three things. If you're struggling with your weight and you're out of shape and you want to become healthy, then you know that you're going to need to exercise and eat right. And depending on your starting point and what kind of shape you're in, it'll probably take several months of consistent behavior to get down to a place where you're at a, at a healthy weight and, and where your heart rate and your blood sugar are where they ought to be and, and on and on and on. And if you want to maintain that degree of health, what do you have to do? You're going to have to eat right and exercise for like another week, right? No, for the rest of your life. I mean, that doesn't change, does it? That effort is not going to change. That strategy is not going to change. In the same way with your thoughts, if you want to experience lasting transformation in your thought life, then you've got to renew your mind according to the principles of God. And you've got to understand that this is going to take time, and it's going to take that same kind of effort and the same kind of strategy 
to make that happen. And some are going to say, well, I've tried positive thinking, and it's nonsense, and it just doesn't work. But I want to make something clear. I'm not talking about positive thinking today. What I'm talking about, and what Paul, the Apostle Paul, is telling us here, he's talking about renewing your mind through not positive thinking, but through biblical thinking. Through biblical thinking. What does God say about it? What's God's thoughts on this? What does God want to do? And I want to make it clear that this is not something you try for a couple of days. It is not that magic pill that, you, that makes your problems go away. It's a process of experiencing total and complete transformation. And it's not going to happen just today or just to, through the next week. It's going to be something that you start and then it will continue on the rest of your life. And it's not going to happen easily. It's going to take effort. And it's not going to happen just by chance. It's going to take a strategy. But i got to tell you, the time and the effort are up to you. You'll either choose to do it or you'll choose not to do it. You will invest the time and you will invest the, the, the effort, the energy, or you won't. God's not going to come and make you. You will choose to do those two things. You'll choose how much of those two things you'll do. You'll either just scratch the surface or you'll just go whole hog. But if you want to be transformed, you're going to have to choose how much and you're going to have to put in the time and the effort. The third one, though, the strategy, God doesn't just leave up to you. God gives you the strategy for your thinking. That's what I want to share with you this morning for the rest of our time. I want to share a strategy. I want to share four areas to focus on as you train yourself to think a new way. Because we can't think the old way. We can't think the worldly way that we grew up with. We have to begin to think in a new way. And God says, I will tell you how to do that. He says, I will give you the strategy for that to happen. And so the first thing that you have to focus on as you learn to think a new way is to think spiritual thoughts and not material. You've got to think spiritual thoughts and not material thoughts. Because there's a difference between moral and spiritual. Of course, I mean, I think in this room we'd say, yeah, we all want to be moral. And there's nothing wrong with that. Um, but there's more to the Christian life than just obeying a bunch of rules. So if all you're wanting to do is find a place where you can be religious and follow a bunch of rules, that's just being moral. But it's not being spiritual. Spiritual and moral are different. There's more to the Christian life than just living by the Ten Commandments. There's a world out there that, that cannot be seen by our human eyes. It's a spiritual world, uh, but it exists beyond the reach of what our eyes can see. It's a spiritual world, and the Christian life consists primarily of our spiritual relationship with Jesus Christ. We don't see him physically. We don't touch him physically. We don't hear his voice physically. But he is there to be seen spiritually and touched spiritually and listened to spiritually. And so we have to learn that there's a spiritual side of our, of our Christian life that is to be predominant. And that has to be worked on. And through... You know, we see the practical application of our spiritual life, and, that's, uh, and that relationship can be seen in our actions. Uh, and, and, but the source of that, of that work, the source of those, those manifestations of our spiritual life, really come from that relationship that is spiritual. It is not, it is not based on morality. It's not based on, on Ten Commandments. It's based on a spiritual relationship with Jesus Christ. And I'm saying that you need to begin to see your life as a spiritual event. If you know Jesus Christ as your Savior, then every day is a spiritual event. You need to recognize that the source of joy and peace and happiness and strength and everything else you need is found in that relationship with God, that relationship with His Son, Jesus Christ. It is not found in success and money and marriage and recreation or anything else. It is found solely in that relationship that you have, that spiritual relationship with Jesus Christ. In 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 12, Paul says this. He says, We have not received the spirit of the world, but the spirit who is from God, that we may understand what God has freely given us. 
Life is a spiritual event. You need to learn to think that way. Think spiritual. Secondly, Paul says, think positive thoughts, not negative. You need to think positive thoughts, not negative. I just said a moment ago uh, that, that this message today is not about positive thinking. It's about biblical thinking. And, but I want to I make a, a, a distinction here, a disclaimer. And that is that though all not, not all positive thinking is biblical. I mean, you can hear a lot of people who talk about positive thinking that, that, aren't, that aren't Christians and what they say is not biblical. But the converse, all biblical thinking is positive. All positive thinking is not biblical, but all biblical thinking you're going to find is always positive. It is positive. Even if the process that you have to go through is, is, is hard, but because God is involved, the outcome is always going to be good, and it may be painful as you go through the process, and you may have to endure some trials, a uh, time of trial, but ultimately the outcome is always going to be good. So we can think positive and not, and not negative. If you've, if you've always been thinking about how, how bad the economy is and how desperate the world situation is, how doomed we all are, then, then you're, getting your, you're not getting your ideas from the Bible. That's not what the Bible teaches. In fact, if you need to read the story if that's what you're doing. In fact, read the back of the book. I have. You know what tells me? God wins. God wins. Not Satan. Not evil. Not doom and gloom. God wins. So we need to learn to think with God's way of thinking. One thing that helped me this is, is I kind of took an intentional break from, from network news. You know, from, you know, Fox News, you know, whatever. You know, it just, because it just gets overwhelming. And I found, man, that's, that's a great release. To stop thinking like the world thinks. Now, I still watch the evening news. I'd watched, I watched, you know, the local news that we have, which really is Phoenix where we don't live, but it's as close as we got to local. Um, so, you know, sometimes at, you know, at 10 o'clock at night, I watch that, but not all the time. And, and you know, it's, it's just changing the way you think. It's saying, I want to think biblical thoughts. I want to think positive thoughts, not the negative all the time. Paul wrote in Philippians 4.8, he said, Finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. For, for those of you who just naturally want to dismiss positive thinking as nothing more than fluff, I want you to pay real close attention. I want you to understand something. God gave to us a command to think positive thoughts. He just did it right here. He commands us to think positive thoughts. Nowhere in the Bible does God say, think negative thoughts. You can search it. It's just not there. He says, think positive thoughts, whatever is good, whatever is pure, whatever is noble, whatever is right, you know, all those things, whatever is lovely, think about those things. He doesn't say, think about all that bad, corrupt, miserable, hopeless, and futile stuff out there. Think about that all the time. Not commanded to do that. Why? Because if that's what you're doing, if you're thinking about all that negative stuff that the world thinks about, all it does is destroy you. It messes your mind up. It keeps you from that spiritual relationship with Jesus Christ. And so he says, don't do that. Instead, think about those things that are positive. And you have to make a conscious choice to think good thoughts. And so instead of thinking about what a wretched, rotten sinner you are, and you certainly are, <laughs> think about instead, think about the overwhelming abundance of God's grace that is available to you. Think about the fact 
that his forgiveness will separate your sin as far away as the east is from the west. Think about this promise to change you into the likeness of his son, Jesus Christ. We have a sin problem, but we can think about it differently. We can praise God for what he's doing about it. And instead of thinking about how miserable your job is and what a tyrant your boss is, and one of our employees is here today, stop thinking that. (laughs) Think about how good things are the good things are that you can accomplish at work. Think about how God is allowing you to be able to take care of your family or provide the things that you need. The Bible never says think about negative things. But it does tell us specifically to think about those positive things. When you make an effort to think and remember that takes effort, God is pleased. And so... You, you say, God, I want to think about those positive things. I want, to, I want to think about the spiritual and not the material. I want to think the positive and not the negative. And then the third step of our strategy that Paul gives us is to think hope and not despair. Think hope and not despair. You know, the Bible talks a lot about hope. It really does. Do you know what another word for hope is? It is optimism. It is optimism. We talked about this not too long ago here in the book of Romans. Paul, this is a major theme in, in the book of Romans. And so optimism. And I told you that, that, that as a Christian, you ought to be optimistic. There's no place for pessimism. That, that No matter what your natural incline, intention is or inclination is, God says, I'm going to transform you. And he wants to transform you into an optimist, not a pessimist. He never changes somebody from an optimist to a pessimist, always from a pessimist to an optimist. You know what optimism is? It is is the assurance that everything will be okay. It is the assurance that everything is going to be okay because God's in control. God knows what's going on. Paul wrote, remember in Romans 8, 28, we said this is a family secret. Unbelievers don't believe this. They can't comprehend it. They can read it, but it makes no sense to them. But those of us who know Jesus Christ as our Savior understand the truth of this, and it is this in Romans 8, 28, and we know that in all things God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. God knows what's going to happen, and this verse gives us permission to be permanently optimistic. To say, God, I'm, gonna, I'm just going to trust you. I'm going to trust the assurance that you're God and you're in control and you're going to bring this about for good. And it tells us that whatever happens, if you stay connected to God, then he will make everything work out for his glory in your life and for your good. And all things, he says, all things work together for good. And the simple truth is that we don't understand why everything happens. I mean, there's stuff that happens we just don't understand. And we want to ask why, and we're just not sure what God is doing about it. In many cases, we don't understand some of how some things could possibly work out for good. And you know what it comes down to? It always comes down to a matter of trust, a matter of faith. Do I really trust God? Do I really have my faith in Him? And if I don't, then do I have any faith at all? Do I really trust God? Because if I can't trust him for these things in my life that I think are so horrible, then can I trust him for my salvation that is eternal? I mean, it's got to be, it's not an either or kind of thing. I mean, you can't have it both ways. You've got to do one or the other. So do you believe God's in control? If he's in control, then you have every reason to be optimistic, and ultimately, he'll make things right. So think hope, not despair. And then fourthly, Paul says here, think eternity, not temporary. Think about eternity, not temporary. You know, when I was growing up, we used to sing a hymn in church. This world is not my home, I'm just passing through. Um, It's a good song. 
Peter said, we're to live as non-permanent residents. We're just passing through. Notice what he says um, in 1 Peter 2.11 to the, to the Christians he's writing to. He says, dear friends, as aliens and strangers in the world. He said, he said you're not permanent residents here. You're aliens, you're strangers. You're just coming through. And so think in those terms. Paul said, Colossians 3, verse 2, set your mind on things above, not on earthly things. Why? Because this is not our home. We're just passing through. We need to remember, we're only here for a little while. And that this world is not what we were created for. A confession. Back when I was in grade school, probably in fifth or sixth grade, I know I was in elementary school, fifth or sixth grade, I was almost in a fight with another kid over something he had said. And somehow, some of our friends got around and they stopped it. But I have a friend who was in a fight, another pastor friend who was in a fight, about the same age, probably his only fight in school. And the teacher that got things straightened out that time looked at them and, and she said, she said, in 25 years, well, what he said to you, Mick, will it matter? In 25 years, will it matter? And he said, you know, even at, at 12 years old, he said, that made sense to me. That in two or three decades down the road, probably going to remember what he said, let alone that it would matter in my life. You know, you can take that same statement, but just add a lot of numbers to it, not 25 years down the road. How about 25,000 years down the road? And 25,000 years down the road, will what somebody said to you or what happened in your life make any difference at all? It won't change anything, will it? And so learn to think not about right now, not about the temporary, but the future. What's God going to do? Try to... Try to live that way because what happens is if you begin to think that way, you'll try to fill your days with activities that will make that answer yes, this will make a difference. You'll be doing things that will make a difference 25,000 years from now rather than fussing and fighting about things that won't matter 25 years from now. Changing the way you think isn't easy. Not as easy as it looks. It's hard work. Henry Ford, you know who he was? The guy who decided to build cars and trucks after his own name? He said, thinking is the hardest work there is, which is the probable reason why so few people engage in it. <laughs> he was right. You know, most of us just allow our thoughts to be carried along by a whim of our emotions. We don't, we don't care where it goes. We don't take any time to think where it's on its way to. We let our circumstances dictate the way we think. But if you want to have lasting change in your life, if you want to be conformed to the image of Jesus Christ, then you, have to let the cir you can't let the circumstances dictate your life. Uh, you have to learn how to, how to take the reins of your thought life. And instead of conforming to the thoughts of this world around you, you let the Word of God determine how you think. And when you're tempted to think materialistically, you say, no, I'm going to think spiritually. When you're tempted to think negatively, you're going to make an effort to think optimistically. You're going to think positive thoughts. When you're tempted to give into your thoughts of despair, you take a hold of uh, a bold step and you think about hope. You think, God, I don't know how you're going to do this, but I'm trusting you right now. And when you're tempted to think that only life here on earth is all that's important, you learn to think with an eternal perspective. Maybe one, one thought. James Allen was a philosopher, a Christian philosopher of the late 19th, early 20th century. He said, you are today where your thoughts have brought you. You will be tomorrow where your thoughts take you. That's what Jesus said. It's essentially just rephasing what Jesus said. 
As a man thinks, so is he. As a woman thinks, so is she. It begins in your mind. If you want to experience change, you've got to change the way you think. You've got to be transformed by renewing of your mind. And I say that to those of you who are believers who know Jesus Christ as your Savior. Every one of you can see that happen. You can choose to put the time in. You can choose to put the effort in. You can choose to follow God's strategy for your thought life. But I've got to tell you, if you're here today and you don't know Jesus as your Savior, not one of those things will work for you. Not one. You can put in all the time, all the effort you want to. You don't have any power to use this strategy because it is only Christ in you that makes that happen. You will become maybe more moral. You might become more religious. But you will die in your sin if you don't let Jesus Christ transform you, first of all, from the inside out. By forgiving your sin, taking it as far away as the east is from the west, washing you whiter than snow on the inside, and then taking up residence in your life. You can do that today. That's work you can't do. All you can do is trust Jesus to be your Savior. Once that happens, then he gives you the opportunity to make the lasting change in this world. Let's pray together. Thank you for joining us today for Faith Point. Reach us online at firstsouthernpv.org or stop by to worship with us if you are in the Prescott Valley area. May God richly bless you today as you allow your faith to intersect with your life.